hello everyone. Um, welcome to this talk about Pony, an actor language for provably safe lockless concurrency. So, who am I? Um, my name is Joe McElvain. I work for a company called Citrus Byte, and I am also on the Pony core team. Um, you can find a link to my GitHub there, my company's website, Pony's website, and also these slides. Oh, that's an interesting display issue. Uh, there we go. So let's start off by talking a little bit about concurrency. Um, what is it, why do we want it, and why do we fear it? Uh, so what is concurrency? Concurrency is having multiple tasks that are being executed in a disjoint, overlapping way. Uh, note these tasks can be executed in parallel on multiple processors and or they could be scheduled in arbitrary slices of time on one or more processors. When we're talking about concurrency, we just mean that we're not sure when each task is running relative to any other. They could be running in parallel or they could be running in some unknown, possibly interleaved sequence. We just don't know. And concurrent code is the code that operates under the paradigm of not knowing this. So to be clear, each individual task is a linear sequence of operations with a well-defined order, but the timing of operations in a task relative to those in other concurrent tasks is arbitrary and undefined. So why do we want concurrency? Um, well, it turns out that just prepping our application for concurrency isn't enough to get any direct benefits, but as we discussed, it allows our code to be run in parallel. And that, in turn, gives us some uh, very important benefits. We want to be able to add processors to get proportionally more throughput. That's scalability. And we don't want to have any idle processors, as that would be inefficient. We want to put all of our processors to work for maximal efficiency. So why do we fear concurrency? Um, what's the problem? Essentially, with concurrency, we want to be able to write applications where we don't know the order in which everything is happening, but we can be sure the final result is correct. That may sound a bit difficult, because it is. Uh, arbitrary relative timings are a type of non-determinism, and we want our apl overall application to be deterministic. So we can easily allow order non-determinism where it doesn't matter. For example, if I ask you to go get, go get the groceries, clean the bathroom, and finish painting the shed, I probably don't care what order you do those things in, uh, as long as they each get done. But if I ask you to go get the groceries, to deposit the paycheck, and pay the rent, the order in which you do these things may matter quite a lot, depending on how much money is in our checking account. So depending on how we structure our code and our concepts, the order non-determinants of concurrency can lead to subtle bugs that are difficult to reason about, reproduce, and test for. So one really common example is a data race where more, uh, one or more tasks access the same data in an undefined order, where some of those order possibilities lead to incorrect behavior. So how do we stay sane? Given that we want concurrency, um, but dealing with concurrency can bring about these problems, how do we go about creating concurrent applications that we can be confident about? Well, we need to embrace a structured approach to concurrency where that structure brings some sanity and reason back to the jumble of non-determinism we'd otherwise be faced with. In other words, we want to impose some strategic limits on ourselves and our code in order to limit the possible states of the resulting concurrent system. So let's take a look at some of the structured approaches and conventions that we see out there. So synchronization. Wherever my tasks share state with each other, I can synchronize access to that state appropriately to avoid concurrency bugs. Um, how does it help? Well, using synchronization primitives like locks allows us to impose restrictions on the relative order of specific groups of operations within concurrent tasks. Effectively, these primitives force the tasks to wait or block for availability where they would otherwise plunge ahead and violate the given restrictions. Typically, a lock is conceptualized as something that you acquire before you do some work on some shared state, then release when you're done. If you as a task are ready to do that work and some other task is holding the lock, you wait around idle. You can't do your work until the other task releases the lock to you. And if there are lots of other tasks waiting for the same lock, you could be waiting quite a while before you get your turn. That's kind of a classic bottleneck scenario. Um, but if planned appropriately and effectively, these restrictions can prevent the kinds of concurrency bugs um, that we want to avoid. Uh, but let's take a look at what synchronization is actually doing to our applications. So I'm going to argue that synchronization reduces concurrency. Um, we've said that synchronization primitives allow the programmer to impose some restrictions on the order of specific groups of operations. And we've also said that concurrency is the paradigm of not knowing the order of operations. So we see that concurrency uh, is 
prevented by synchronization um, for certain operations. As an extreme example, note that if we use a common lock to synchronize the entirety of each task uh, in a program, so they're all using the same single global lock and the entire tasks are synchronized, effectively at this point there's no concurrency left at all. The, uh, they'll execute sequentially uh, rather than concurrently. Um, so that was an extreme and contrived example, but we can see that less extreme cases work the same way. Um, the more synchronization we introduce in our tasks, the more we end up waiting around and the more we reduce the degree of effective concurrency. So stepping back a little bit, yeah, that's obviously what we want to do, right? Um, to impose a few specific restrictions on the order of events so that we can ensure correctness, but leaving the rest of the order up to random chance. However, using synchronization reduces concurrency in such a way that it makes waiting for things a central part of our approach. And that comes up against our earlier goal of efficiency. We want to keep things moving as much as possible. We want to avoid idle tasks when there's still more work to be done. So this puts us in the unfortunate situation where the more we use uh, synchronization, the more we lose the benefits concurrency gives us. Synchronization may be fine in small doses, but if we lean on it as a crutch and use it as our go-to uh, concurrency safety mechanism, our application performance will probably suffer. So a familiar example of over-synchronization is the global interpreter lock found in the reference inter implementation of Ruby, um, in which almost all operations of the interpreter are synchronized by a single global lock which severely reduces the actual concurrency that's possible using Ruby threads. Um, it's worth noting that competing implementations of Ruby, Rubinius and JRuby, um, improve on the strategy by using many fine-grained locks rather than one single global lock, so that some operations may be concurrent with some others because they're not contending with the same lock. Um, so to avoid losing too much concurrency to over-synchronization, we want to use synchronization primitives in a precise, detail-oriented way, synchronizing as little as is necessary to be safe. Um, if we go back to our earlier example of Ruby's global interpreter lock and the work in J, uh, Rubinius and JRuby to separate this into more fine-grained locks, this is basically what we're talking about. Some more precision helps us to keep more opportunities for concurrency while still remaining exclusive where it counts. Um, however, in many cases, this work is non-trivial, and even when done, Understanding and maintaining it often entails a lot of additional cognitive complexity. Thinking about all these locks, the circumstances under which you need to acquire each one, the circumstances under which the total interlocking system might deadlock or otherwise behave badly. Um, it gets to be quite a lot for a human or an automated tool to reason about. So in essence, the more precisely we use synchronization, the finer grained locks we use, the more difficult it becomes to reason about the possible outcomes and the more likely we are to cause or fail to prevent concurrency bugs. Um, so, regrettably, using synchronization with concurrency creates a situation where the more performance optimal our code becomes, the more finer grained locks, um, the more difficult it becomes to understand and maintain, which is a terrible trade-off, and grappling with it in this way is one of the main reasons why many of us are afraid of concurrency. So let's take a look at some other conventions and approaches. So share nothing. If my tasks share no state with each other, then safe concurrency is trivial. Why is it safe? Yeah. Why is it safe? Um, well, the concurrency bugs we highlighted were all related to the interdependence of concurrent tasks. Let's put it another way. Um, we get problems when we share tasks, uh, share state between tasks. Um, so if we want to avoid the problems associated with access to shared state, one trivial remedy is to avoid shared state altogether. And indeed, when you can pull it off, it works beautifully. Um, it scales perfectly because there's no relationship between the tasks at all, so there's no possibility of a bottleneck as you scale. Um, if our concurrent tasks are truly interdependent from one, uh, independent from one another, the non-determinism of relativing, relative timings doesn't matter at all. Uh, and every possible order of events is correct behavior because the tasks don't care about each other. So it is always safe, it's easy to reason about, easy to migrate between distinct machines, um, scales perfectly, but it only applies to tasks that can be made independent um, and it breaks as soon as you need to share something. So let's take a look at another. Um, sharing immutable state. If my tasks share only immutable state with each other, then safe concurrency is trivial. Why is it safe? Well, with some consideration, we can see that it's not quite necessary to prohibit all sharing. Um, rather, it's sufficient to make sure that anything we do share is immutable. It's guaranteed never to change. If the data in the shared state is guaranteed to never change, then any task can read from it at any time and always see the same data. There's no need to synchronize because a read operation will never have any influence over the outcome of another read operation. 
Um, these nice properties, as well as others, make immutable data structures a popular choice for shared data and a central part of a paradigm for many modern functional programming languages. As long as your data structures are immutable, there are no data races to worry about. Um, so it's always safe, uh, it's easy to reason about, provides a way to share global data, um, giving into the restriction that the data has to be immutable. And uh, the disadvantages are that it can't migrate between distinct machines without copying data, uh, only applies to tasks that can be made otherwise independent, and it breaks as soon as you need to share something that is mutable. So what else do we have here? Um, transferring isolated state. If I can transfer exclusive access to a given state object from task to task, then the one task that can reach the state object at any given time may safely mutate it without violating concurrency safety. So we get bugs uh, when we share a mutable state, so let's not share any of it. Um, let's pass it across time. Uh, let's talk about what we mean when we say isolated. Isolated state is only accessible from one task at a time, so it's never really concurrently shared. Uh, when tasks are implemented as threads, this is sometimes called thread ownership or message passing. Um, we can pass it across time, but we're not actually sharing it among tasks. Um, so when I say it needs to be securely transferred, I mean that if we guarantee the original task doesn't hold on to any dangling references to, this, to the transferred state object, uh, then it's still isolated when it reaches the next task. But if even a single reference is retained in the original task, sometimes called a leaked reference, all safety goes out the window because both tasks have access to the same mutable state object at the same time. Um, the leaked reference is the problem. Um, so this method usually requires very strict discipline to avoid leaking any references, or you need a language that supports enforcing that no references are leaked, taking the need for that discipline off your shoulders. Now it's easy to reason about. There's no mutability restrictions. It's compatible with zero copy optimizations. Uh, for example, if you have a byte buffer that you take in off the network, um, you want to make some modifications to it, pass it to the next task, make some more modifications, which may uh, pass it to another task all the way to the end of your processing chain, um, and all without having to copy the data in the buffer, um, just passing the pointer from task to task. Um, it's nice to avoid copying the buffer um, because it can be a really performance killer when the buffer is very large. So the disadvantages are that the state is not truly shared. Um, there's no concurrent access to it, and it requires careful discipline or language support. So what should we choose? A, A synchronization. B, share nothing, C, share immutable state, or D, transferred isolated state? And our answer is all the above. Um, each of these paradigms has its advantages and disadvantages, and they each have their place in our application, so why should we have to choose? Um, however, we do want to avoid traditional synchronization primitives because of the performance versus reasoning trade-off that we discussed earlier. Um, so we'll still have some patterns that are analogous to synchronization in that they'll provide a way to have transactions that have exclusive access to some state, but we're going to have to construct these patterns with careful intent to avoid making waiting a central part of the solution. So what do we want? Um, we want to use tools and conventions that make these safe patterns easy to use. Uh, programmers are lazy, so we have to make it easy for them to do the right thing or we'll mostly choose to do the wrong thing. Um, some people call this falling into the pit of success. In fact, um, let's take it a step further and say we never want to uh, deploy an application that isn't concurrency safe. If we verify and enforce the safe patterns, then we can write highly concurrent applications while remaining fully confident in their safety. Um, since we're mixing and matching the safe concurrency patterns, uh, we also want to make it clear to our tools and to ourselves which patterns we're using for any given part of our code. For example, no human or tool that's reading our code should ever have to guess whether a given state object is intended to be using the immutable pattern or the isolated pattern. Um, explicit clarity of intent uh, will help keep our applications easy to reason about as their behavior becomes more complex. And we want to show that our intent uh, with a like, clean syntax um, that's consistent and simple to understand. So with that in mind, Pony. Um, there's a link to the Pony website, and Pony on GitHub, 
Uh, Pony is a programming language that was made with exactly these goals in mind. Um, it was built to empower you to have an explicit and elevated dialogue with the compiler about concurrency patterns in your program so that you and the compiler can work together to prove that what you're doing with concurrency is safe. Um, also that you and your application don't have to worry about it later while the program is running. Your program gets to plunge ahead without waiting for locks or checking for safety, and you get to sleep through the night while your pager stays silent. So Pony is a static language. Um, the compiler is the tool that statically analyzes and enforces the safe concurrency patterns we've been talking about. In case you're not familiar, static just means it doesn't have to run your code to understand it. The compiler understands your code ahead of time um, through static analysis. If Pony were a dynamic language, it wouldn't start to understand your code until it was running, and this effectively means it would have to run your code surrounded by a bunch of runtime checks to ensure that concurrency is safe at every step of the way, um, effectively slowing down your code as well as making you add a bunch of guard code to rescue concurrency violation errors if they do happen at runtime. Um, you wouldn't know ahead of time if there are any violations or not because you didn't have static analysis. Um, so with a static analysis, your application can safely plunge ahead and assume that it was all verified to be safe at compile time. Um, in terms of performance, Pony should be comparable to other uh, languages that compile down to a low-level LLVM uh, format like C or C++, Rust or Go. Um, it's going to be analogous with those because it also compiles down to a low-level LLVM format. Um, yeah, it's just, yeah. So it is a strongly type language. Um, verifying type safety is part of the static analysis that the compiler does. Uh, all references in your program must have an explicit or inferred type, and all types in the program have well-defined subtyping relationships to each other. So some of you may groan a little bit about static types. I know I definitely groaned at one time. Um, I was definitely felt I was comfortable writing robust code in a typeless language like Ruby or Python, and I had often argued before that I came to Pony that strongly typed languages usually create more hassle for the programmer than they solve real problems. Um, after I got hooked on Pony, I've changed my views on that a little bit, but at the time I came to Pony, I was quite skeptical of the benefits of strong typing. However, in Pony, the concurrency patterns we've been talking about are part of the type system, um, which is a big deal because while it may be pretty easy for you to intuitively understand and reason about what types of objects you're dealing with in a well-organized application, it can be much harder to understand and reason about how those objects might be accessed concurrently, and having those assumptions be implicit means that you and others will inevitably get confused at some point as to what's going on and who can access what and whether waiting for a lock is needed. So this is what ultimately sold me on embracing Pony's strongly typed approach. Um, the safe concurrency pattern enforcement that forms the core value proposition of the language couldn't exist without the language having the information it gets from strong typing. Uh, in Pony, the concurrency access pattern for every reference is part of its type. Uh, Pony is an actor language. This means that instead of expressing concurrency in terms of explicit threads or fibers or coprocessors, uh, we use a higher level abstraction called actors. Um, in short, actors are objects that don't provide synchronous access to any of their internal state. So you cannot read an actor's fields from outside of it. You cannot call an actor method and expect to get a return value. Instead, you pass it an asynchronous message. Uh, that triggers a corresponding behavior when the message is received. Um, you don't know or care when that is, and you don't spend any time waiting around for a result. So essentially, when we think about actors, we shift our paradigm from thinking about sequences of actions and instead think about our program in terms of causes and effects. Uh, forcing ourselves into this paradigm shift in turn makes us the, the runtime scheduler able to execute these tasks in parallel. Um, any task that is any task can be executed in parallel with another task, provided that the effect does not precede the cause. Um, we call that causal message order. Uh, I don't want to get too deep into causal message order because our time is limited, but uh, suffice to say that Pony's causal message order actually provides a stronger order guarantee than other actor languages like Erlang. Um, messages originating from the same source actor that are sent to the same destination actor have a well -defined, uh, and, and have a well-defined causal order uh, on the source actor are guaranteed to arrive at their destination in the same order um, that they were sent. Um, so if my logger is an actor and writing to the log is an asynchronous message, um, I can fire off multiple log messages uh, originating from the same actor, and they will show up uh, in the same order at the logger actor. Um, they may be interleaved with messages from other actors, but as long as, it's from, as, long as they're all from point A to point B, uh, all of those A to B messages will 
uh, that have a strong causal uh, order on A will be uh, in the same order on B. So this turns out to be a really useful guarantee for user applications, eliminating a whole class of common concurrency mistakes. But it isn't just a nice feature that the creators of Pony decided to, to include to make programmers' lives easier. Uh, causal message order is actually critical to the way the Pony garbage collector works. Pony has a per-actor garbage collector with no stop the world step. Um, it uses a message passing protocol to track references across actor boundaries, and uh, the garbage collector protocol hinges on the causality of message order. Um, so if you're interested in reading more about the garbage collector uh, protocol and how that works, there's an academic paper on the Pony website that you can check out. Um, so we give our actor declarations to the Pony compiler, uh, defining their behavior for receiving each kind of message they can handle. And then in the Pony runtime, the execution of the program is just the unfolding of these messages over time from initial conditions and from external input. Uh, the runtime takes care of scheduling execution in an efficient way using a work stealing algorithm that also has an academic paper you can read about it. Um, and it gets scheduled on a fixed number of system threads uh, by default equal to the number of cores on your machine. That's an option you can adjust uh, when running your application. Um, so you never have to worry about spinning up your own threads or whether you've spun up too many or anything like that. Uh, so coming back to locks for a moment. Because our actors uh, follow the safe concurrency patterns we've been discussing, there's no need for any synchronization primitives in Pony. Pony applications are lockless by nature. Uh, in a way, the actor is sort of a synchronization primitive in that it has exclusive access to its own state. But an actor only accepts asynchronous messages to cause reads or writes to that state. So we've set up our paradigm to promote access without waiting. Um, in fact, Pony, in Pony, there are no blocking operations at all. So your actors are never waiting around within a behavior unable to receive new messages. Which brings us to our next slide. Um, blocking in Pony is an anti-pattern. Um, in fact, it's not even possible to block unless you're using the FFI to call some native function that might block. Uh, some other actor-oriented languages include a blocking receive feature. That is, they have a way to wait for a specific response from another actor uh, or perhaps a timeout if this response didn't come within some expected period of time. Pony doesn't have this, but it's often requested by users who are coming in from other languages. So what gives? Well, such a feature is usually implemented in one of two ways. Uh, the most straightforward way is just to let the actor block, preventing it from handling any more messages while it's tied up waiting for that one special message, which again may never arrive or may take arbitrarily long to arrive. This means your actor may spend a lot of time idle when, in fact, there are more messages for it and more work to do. Uh, this makes our actors start to look a lot more like traditional synchronization primitives, um, always waiting around, which is what we were trying to avoid with the system. So that's not ideal, and there is a slightly more clever way to go about it, which is while we wait for this actor to receive that one special message um, and take some follow-up action based on the result, we allow that actor to handle other incoming messages as well, uh, each according to their appropriate behavior. So essentially this means that every time we end up do a blocking receive, we would capture some bit of state in the runtime that holds on to the info about what message we're waiting for and what the rest of that method body is for what we're going to do when we get it. Uh, and then every time a message comes in, we compare it to the list of special messages that we're waiting for, uh, and if we can find a match, uh, then we finish the executing follow-up behavior uh, and clear out that bit of state. Otherwise, the message is one of those that we have a defined behavior for, and we execute that behavior. And maybe it adds uh, its own blocking receive. And uh, you can see that maybe over time, those tiny little bits of state could quickly add up to an arbitrarily big chunk of memory if they're not getting cleared out fast enough, um, which is a problem. So we could put some kind of a limit on that memory, but that just means that when we reach that limit, we're back to simple waiting again, just like before. Um, the other problem is that our actor behaviors are no longer atomic if we do this. That is, actor behaviors in Pony act like atomic transactions over the actor's internal state. Uh, we have some current state, the message comes in, we execute it in full, and then now we have a current state that might look a little bit different if the behavior involved changing some of the fields. Um, so if behaviors were not atomic, uh, it would mean that at the start of the behavior, you could check the value of some internal actor field, uh, then call a method somewhere deep down in its stack that chooses to spend some time waiting for a result, uh, and then the internal field that you checked before and made that decision about now has an undefined value. That is, since you called a blocking method and the actor had a chance to handle other messages, that field may have been changed by those messages. So in a world where uh, actors can block and actors keep right on running um, to receive other messages, you can't confidently call a method without worrying about whether the rug is going to be pulled out from under you. 
Um, and in fact, I attended a talk yesterday by uh, Christoph Yintz, where he talked about the Ethereum DAO hack last year that lost $50 million from the project when a hacker exploited a reentrancy bug in their Ethereum smart contract that was made possible by exactly this kind of problem. Um, the, uh, the, the, the contract execution was not atomic um, over the state of the contract. So this kind of bug can be really subtle and can sneak past some really smart people to cause a lot of trouble. Um, so to make our programs easy to reason about, we reject both of these solutions, and we choose to just never be idle and always be atomic. And if we ever do need to store some state to mark that we're waiting for some special message, we have to do it in explicit application logic. Keep that state in a field of the actor, and make it obvious what happens while we wait. Um, the ramifications for waiting a concurrent program can be severe, and so if we're ever waiting for something, we want those ramifications to be staring us in the face, challenging us to find a different pattern, or at least acknowledge the engineering trade-offs of the pattern we did choose. So this brings up another critical point about concurrent programming. Um, anytime you try to hide the asynchronous nature of it to make the asynchronous appear synchronous, you disguise the truth and you prevent the critical thinking that's required to make good decisions. It's like going through a store and tearing off all the price tags so you can't tell which uh, items are costly and which ones are cheap. Uh, we want simplicity, but we don't want to get it by sweeping the complexity under the rug. We want to distill the essence of the problem and bring it to the surface where we can make smart choices about how to solve it. And that's what we try to do with concurrent programming in Pony. Um, we don't want to make the costly appear cheap, and we don't want to make the risky appear safe, and we don't want to make the asynchronous appear synchronous. So after all that, let's take a look at some basic syntax for the language. Um, here we have a class defined in a way you should find familiar from other object-oriented languages. Um, now, if you're a diehard functional programming advocate, and the fact that I just said object-oriented has you looking for the door, uh, just try to keep an open mind and disassociate from the baggage that you typically associate with classes and objects. Um, Pony mixes concepts from both object-oriented programming and functional programming uh, in a practical way that's made possible by its unique type system. Um, so we'll describe that system in more detail in a few slides, so just stick with me. Um, our class here is called person, and it has some fields, name and age as well as some uh, functions, greeting and age diff. You'll note that each field has an explicit type. Name is a string. Age is a U8, which is short for unsigned 8-bit integer. Uh, each method also has a return type. Uh, greeting returns a string. Age diff returns a U8. Uh, like in some other languages, the final expression of the method is implicitly used as the return value. Uh, and note that branching expressions, like the if-then-else block in age diff, uh, also have a value. It's the value of the final expression in whatever the executed branch was. Um, sometimes methods may conceptually have no return value, and in our type system we say those, type, those methods return none, uh, which is a, just a, a primitive type that has, uh, it's basically like a primitive singleton um, that has no fields, no state, no methods, uh, and it can be added implicitly to the end of the function uh, if you don't specify a return type. So you'll see that the age diff method also accepts an argument called that, which is of the person type. Uh, because the keyword this is used to refer to the current receiver, just like in C++, um, using that is a common pony idiom for referring to another object of the same type. So let's take a look at how references work. Um, here we have three references, two let references and one ver reference, each referencing a unique new person object. We can just say person here in the code because referring to a type where a value is expected will implicitly call the default constructor. Um, on the fourth line, we can reassign the var reference named C to point to uh, the person object that, uh, that A is pointing to. Um, so now we throw away that third person object and A and C refer to the same person. Um, and we cannot, however, on the fifth line, reassign B because, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, we can't reassign B because B is a let reference. Um, and it can only be assigned once. That should be familiar to uh, folks who are like JavaScript or other languages that have that convention. So let's take a look at reference capabilities, um, which is Pony's novel way of representing the concurrency patterns we've been discussing. Uh, Pony uses a short keyword called a reference capability to represent each of these patterns. Uh, reference capabilities denote various restrictions on how object references may be used. There's the share nothing pattern, represented as tag, the share immutable state pattern, represented as val, and the transfer isolated state pattern, which is represented as iso. Uh, the reference capability is part of the type of a reference. 
It also respects the paradigm of capability security in that the read and write restrictions associated with a reference capability of a type can be attenuated to a lower capability but never escalated to a higher capability. Um, so the compiler will enforce that as part of the rules of the type system. So let's look at the full table of Pony reference capability. There are six in all. Each object reference in Pony is marked by a specific reference capability, one of these six keywords, uh, which dictates what can and cannot be done with the object reference. Uh, specifically, as shown in the third, fourth, and fifth column, uh, whether or not this reference can read or write the object's data, whether or not other references can read or write the object's data, and as a result, whether that reference is sendable to another actor. So a reference capability can only be sent to another actor if doing so is guaranteed to be safe. That is, if the other restrictions here are enough to impose um, a strong enough guarantee that, it mit that meets one of the three patterns that we discussed earlier. And we showed the explicit link in the last slide. So let's take a quick look at what each capability uh, means. Ref is a mutable reference, um, the kind of reference you'd find as your only option in many object-oriented languages. Another way to look at this is that it has no access constraints at all. For this reason, it's not safely sendable to another actor. Um, val is an immutable reference, uh, which is the kind of reference you'd find as your only option in most functional programming languages. Uh, it is read-only, and it's guaranteed that no other references exist anywhere that can write to the same object. It's only readable to you, and it's only readable to everyone else. So it can never be changed once it's become a val. Um, this makes it sendable, as it's safe to share concurrently. Box is a read-only reference. Uh, however, it's not strongly immutable because there may be other references that exist somewhere that can read or write the object. Uh, so even though you can't change the object with your reference, it's possible that it could be changed out from under you by someone else. Um, it could also be, happen that it is immutable globally, um, but you just have a box and you don't know. Um, so th that means it's not safe to share concurrently, and it's not sendable. ISO is an isolated reference. Uh, it is read-write unique, meaning that the reference can access the object, read and write, but no other references anywhere exist that can access the object at all. Uh, because only one actor can hold an isolated reference to the object at any given time, no concurrent access is possible, so it's safe to mutate it. It is sendable, but note that an actor must give up its isolated reference before it can be sent to another actor. We call this consuming the reference. In fact, because of the uniqueness constraint, you can't alias an isolated reference at all without downgrading it to a, a different reference capability without the uniqueness constraint. So because it's isolated, it can actually be downgraded to any other capability. Um, because when you give up your access to it uh, to, as part of the downgrade process, uh, there's nobody anywhere that has any access to it, so it, it can become anything. Um, there are similar rules for consuming uh, other references and what they can become as, as part of like the, the reference capability decay as you lose permission. Um, uh, yeah, so TRAN is similar to an isolated reference, uh, but it is only write unique instead of read write unique, meaning that the other object references uh, can exist, but none of them can write to the object. You're the only one that can. So it's not sendable because it's still mutable and cannot be shared. Um, but you could consume it to send it, because by consuming your one reference, you can decay the TRAN to uh, a val uh, and make it immutable, because you, you were the only one that could write to it. So when you give up your writable reference, it becomes immutable. And this is a common way for people to set up an object, initialize some of its, uh, the data in it, and then make it immutable so that it can be shared. Um, that's why it's called TRAN, because it's short for transitional. Tag is an opaque reference. Uh, it allows neither reading nor writing any of the underlying objects fields, um, which may not seem very useful at first, but tag is actually the capability used to refer to other actors in Pony, which makes sense because you shouldn't be able to read or write an actor's fields from outside the actor. Um, so the tag reference does have the address or identity of the object, so you can still use the tag to do identity comparisons, and you can still use it to send asynchronous messages to other actors, because just having the address of the actor is enough to be able to send it messages. Um, that's exactly what a tag reference is. It's an address without any access. So let's take a look at where we use reference capabilities. Here's our earlier example class up at the top. Um, notice that we did not use any reference capabilities in our first rendering of it. 
And that's because we were just using the implicit defaults everywhere. The second rendering here shows the implicit defaults expanded um, for us to look at. Each type has a default reference capability. So if you don't specify a reference capability when you declare a reference, it will use the default capability for that type. So string and u8 uh, expand to string val and u8 val uh, because those types were declared in the standard library and they were declared as having val as their default capability. This means that if you ever want to use a reference to a mutable string, you have to declare it as string iso or string tran or string ref. Um, otherwise, you'll get the default of string val. The person type uh, declaration expands to class ref person, which is where that default capability gets set up. So uh, you can think about it as ref is the default default for a class. Um, if you were declaring person as an immutable data structure, um, you would declare it as class val person. Um, and then you'd also implement it a little bit differently as a result. Um, but that, that, that in everywhere, person would get expanded to person val. But as, as of here, it's class ref person. So everywhere where we wrote person before is getting expanded to person ref by default. So we also see the box reference capability in the definition of the age diff method. Um, fun box age diff. So this isn't referring to the arguments or the return value, it's referring to the receiver, um, which is the current person object instance that we're operating on. Um, the value of this, if you uh, reference this. And it's also what you use for accessing and manipulating fields um, or calling other local methods. So if we did want to, th this makes sense for it to be box because we're just measuring the person, we're not, we don't need to change it. Um, so by default, any function that you declare is going to be a read-only function unless you specify it as fun ref or one of the other capabilities. Um, but fun box and fun ref are the most common. Um, so it's basically a way for you to declare that, OK, this method is read-only, um, and thus it can be called on any object reference that only has read access or one that has read and write access, um, but it doesn't require write access. Uh, if you require write access, then you declare it as a fun ref, and the compiler um, will allow you to change fields from within it or call other fun ref methods. So basically, imposing the restriction on uh, what our method does um, allows it more freedom in how you call it. Um, if Box is a, is a pretty lenient capability. It's about as lenient as you can get without being tag, but tag couldn't read any fields. Um, so uh, the, it's restricting what we do inside the method, but it's, uh, by, by extension of that, it's allowing you more freedom in how you call it, um, which is a, like a common theme in, um, in compilers. Uh, compo imposing restrictions is going to give you more freedom in other ways. Uh, so reference capabilities in Pony are all about carefully choosing and communicating the restrictions we want so that we have the freedom and concurrency where it counts. So we can mix and match the capability patterns um, and choose the right restrictions for each part of our application based on our needs, uh, and the compiler will help us make sure that it is all safe in the end. So there's a bit of a learning curve um, for capabilities. They may seem a little bit convoluted at first, but if you spend a little time using them, they become second nature, um, and you start to see all of your concurrency problems in these terms. Um, these concepts are implicit in our code anyway when we're writing concurrent applications, usually, um, and making the ideas explicit in syntax helps us to organize our thoughts and prove to ourselves and the compiler that what we're doing is safe. One of the really powerful benefits of how reference capabilities are implemented in Pony is that they have no runtime cost. There are no safety checks uh, in your running application because it's all proven safe at compile time. In fact, reference capabilities don't exist in the runtime at all. They are compile time constraints that fall away in the final compiled code, um, and they're not there at runtime at all. Um, so this is sometimes called a zero cost abstraction. Obviously, it translates to a cost at compile time, but not a cost at runtime. Um, the other runtime cost you avoid is the cost of synchronization. Um, so Pony is lockless, so every time your code is accessing data, it doesn't ever have to wait to acquire a lock. Uh, the access is already proven to be safe, so yeah, you're only plunging ahead uh, or sending off asynchronous messages uh, and never waiting around. 
So we talked a lot about the motivation for reference capabilities um, in Pony, and we've talked uh, the basics of how they work. But we've only kind of scratched the surface here. There's a lot more when it gets to uh, how reference capabilities are modified as you view them from the object uh, into one of its fields. So an object may have a reference capability, and a field has a reference capability, and when you try to access a field from outside the object, you see it as modified by that outer capability. Um, it also gets a little bit more complicated when you deal with generic types um, and type parameters. Uh, but my goal with this talk was to give you an introduction to the paradigm that Pony brings to the table um, and give you a solid understanding of the basics and a motivation for it and hopefully pique your curiosity to go out there and learn more about uh, everything here with our tutorial and our other online content. Um, we have a mailing list, we have an IRC channel. Um, so even if you don't think you'll want to learn Pony uh, and use it on any significant projects, I'd still hi highly recommend learning a little bit more. If you take the time to really wrap your head around reference capabilities, it's one of those things that really changes the way you think about concurrent data safety in every other programming language you work with, or at least did for me. So if I've succeeded in piquing your curiosity or if you have any other questions for me, feel free to come up and say hello after the talk. Um, I'd also be more than happy to meet up with anyone tonight who's interested in doing a deep dive into any of the concepts or details that I didn't have time to cover today, um, or show off interesting code samples, or chat about how Pony might be applicable to a particular problem domain you're interested in, or anything of that sort. So if you're interested in that, come find me, and we can make some plans to meet up. Um, I love talking to people about Pony, so don't be a stranger. Uh, thanks, everyone. <laughs>